This represents the first in a series of lectures in which I'll teach you about the properties of gases. Before beginning, I wanted to show you a link to uh, another funny video that I posted on my YouTube channel. I'll also post a link here for you to click on and open it in a separate tab if you want. You don't have to watch it, of course, but if you want to, I think it's hopefully kind of funny. At this point, I wanted to start with a quick story. Years ago, I was uh, buying lunch at a McDonald's restaurant when there was a man who was obviously inebriated standing up on one of the tables in the restaurant and singing, I should say screaming, scream singing, screaming. Anyway, at the top of his lungs, the lyrics to the song, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain. The part of the song that he seemed to emphasize the most and be the most entertained by was a part where he kept singing Four White Horses over and over. It was kind of funny, but I think it was obviously disturbing some of the customers around him. Finally, and you know, unfortunately for the manager, the manager had to come out with a couple of employees and physically escort slash <clears throat> push this man out of the restaurant. And he went, but he did resist a little bit. After they pushed him out the door, uh, thinking that he was completely gone, I turned back to the line uh, where I was, you know, waiting, and this guy suddenly jumped back into the store and screamed out one last time, four white horses, and then left. With that said, let's begin. After uh, today's presentation, or series of presentations in, here in chapter 10, which will cover sections 1 through 4 of our text, you should be able to do the following. First, understand the basic characteristics of gases. Be able to interconvert between different units of pressure. Define the following terms, ideal gas and STP. Know the volume of an ideal gas at STP. And perform calculations using the combined gas law, equation 10.8 from our book, which I'll discuss later on. So thus far this semester, we've talked mostly about individual atoms and molecules. In real life, however, we don't have direct intimate experiences with atoms and molecules. Instead, we interact with matter as gases, liquids, or solids, which are comprised of enormous, three exclamation points, numbers of atoms and molecules. In this chapter, we'll discuss gases. Before starting, I'm going to first describe solids and liquids at a molecular level. I do this so that you can better contrast solids and liquids with gases, which I'll then subsequently describe. Solids have a constant shape and volume. And believe it or not, their particles are constantly moving, colliding with other particles and changing their direction and velocity. This might be hard to believe, but it's true. Though particles inside solids don't do this as quickly as those inside liquids and gases. Each particle inside a solid is trapped in a small cage with walls formed by other particles that are strongly attracted to each other. Now, I realize these two statements seem contradictory, but once again, I'm trying to say that inside those small cages, the uh, individual particles of solids are moving around at quite a high rate. We'll now learn about the nature of solids by looking at an engine block which is made of steel, which happens to be a solid. If you're able to zoom in really, really closely to the engine block substance, the steel here, and look at the individual particles that comprise the steel, you'd see that uh, it's actually made up of zillions of tiny particles that are all bumping and tugging and wiggling around each other, but ultimately stay in the same place on a macroscopic view. Furthermore, as the temperature rises, you'd be able to see that the particles move faster and faster and bump into each other more and more. In fact, if the temperature increases enough, neighboring particles push further and further apart, and the solid steel actually expands. And believe it or not, that does happen with engine blocks. If they get too exceedingly hot, they can actually expand and ruin the engine. So when compared with solids, liquids also have constant volumes but varying shapes. Their particles move around more quickly than those of solids. This movement breaks the attractions that would form an analogous structural cage in a solids. As a result, each particle in a liquid is constantly moving from one part of the liquid to another. Let's take a look at an example liquid contained within this flask. If you were able to zoom in visually so close that you could see the individual particles of liquid here within this flask, you'd notice that they move around quickly enough for the attractions between the particles to be constantly broken and reformed. Furthermore, particles inside a liquid are much less organized than in solids with slightly more space between them. Beyond this, particles inside a liquid also move throughout the container, which is different from those in a solid. The container is, of course, responsible for holding the liquid's shape. Although the volume in a liquid remains constant, its shape does not. When liquids evaporate, heat from the environment causes the individual particles in them to move more quickly. If we were able to look in very closely at the surface of a container of liquid, we would see that individual particles 
on the top of that surface are being kicked or propelled or impacted by the particles beneath them. When that propulsion is sufficiently strong, it can actually eject a surface molecule out, propelling it away from the particles beneath it. Once that particle is ejected su with sufficient distance that it no longer feels attraction to the particles that it just left, this particle now becomes a gas particle. That is what happens on a molecular level when liquids evaporate or boil. Let's now look at gases. Gases have variable shape and volume. The volume part is different from liquids. Gas particles move and zoom around much more quickly than the particles in liquids and solids. Gas particles have larger average distances between them than the individual particles for liquids and solids. Gas particles experience comparatively little attraction to each other. And constant collisions between gas particles lead to constant changes in their directions and velocities. If we were able to zoom in very closely so that we could visually inspect the individual gas molecules coming out of the exhaust in this tailpipe, we would see that they're so far apart that there's relatively little intermolecular attraction between them. Furthermore, generally speaking, gas particles move in roughly straight lines, but are constantly changing speed and direction as they impact other gas molecules and surfaces in their environment. With that molecular vision of gases in our minds, I now want to teach you about pressure. According to our text, in everyday terms, pressure conveys the idea of a force, a push, that tends to move something in a given direction. Pressure, P, is defined in science as the force, F, that acts on a given area, A, according to this equation. Gases exert a pressure on any surface with which they are in contact. The gas in an inflated balloon, for example, exerts a pressure on the inside surface of the balloon. The SI unit for pressure is a pascal. Some other commonly used pressure units include atmospheres, abbreviated ATMs, millimeters of mercury, whose atomic symbol looks close to the word hug, pounds per square inch, or PSI, and tor. And here are the numerical interconversions between those units. I would like you, the students taking this class for me, to memorize that one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. I'll give you all of the rest of the conversions that you may need when you need them. On Earth, all of us experience something called atmospheric pressure. This is caused essentially by the pressure exerted down upon our bodies by all of the gas molecules above us in the atmosphere, as shown in this figure. You can imagine yourself, for example, standing right there in what looks like northern United States or Midwest United States, and having all of the gas particles in the entire atmosphere all the way up to the stratosphere being pushed down or piled down on top of you. The amount of pressure or force or weight that you feel exerted upon your body by all of those gas molecules above you is called atmospheric pressure. It stands to reason, then, that at higher altitudes, you experience lower atmospheric pressure. Because if you're up on top of a mountain, there are fewer molecules of gas between you and the upper atmosphere. That is, there are fewer molecules of gas on top of your shoulders. So you don't feel or experience as much pressure pushing down at you. At lower altitudes, you experience higher atmospheric pressures because there are more gaseous molecules between you and the top of the upper atmosphere all pushing down on your body. As we go underwater, and you've probably experienced this if you've dived underwater, we experience the combined pressures of all of the water molecules above us plus all of the gas molecules in the atmosphere above them. And those pressures, especially with the density of water relative to the density of air, can be quite significant. Scientists have devised a series of laws to help us understand and predict gases' behaviors. Before delving into these laws, we have to understand the following terms. First. STP. In the world of science, STP does not stand for Stone Temple Pilots. It stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. And it is defined as one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius, or 273.15 kelvins. Next, ideal gas. In the world of science, an ideal gas is a hypothetical gas whose pressure, volume, and temperature relationships can all be predicted by the ideal gas law, which I'll explain to you shortly. Most gases are ideal gases at some range at or near or around STP. Gases begin to behave non-ideally under extreme temperatures, pressures, or volumes. Here's the last bit of info I want you to know from this slide. One mole of any gas, regardless of its molecular weight, at STP 
has a volume of 22.41 liters per mole. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't matter what gas you have. If it's an STP, it will always occupy a volume of 22.41 liters. That's pretty cool. So the following equation right here is known as the combined gas law. It combines and interrelates elements of pressure, volume, and temperature. So P1, V1, and T1 are all initial pressure, volume, and temperatures, while P2, V2, and T2 are all final pressure, volumes, and temperatures. This equation can be used to predict gases' pressures, volumes, and temperatures as those things are varied. Let's go ahead and use that by looking at a problem. A fixed amount of gas at 21 degrees Celsius exhibits a pressure of 752 torr and occupies a volume of 5.12 liters. Calculate the volume the gas will occupy if the pressure is changed to 1.88 atmospheres while the temperature is held constant. And then calculate the volume the gas will occupy if the temperature is increased to 175 while the pressure is held constant. Now I invite you to try this problem on your own first. If you wish, I'll post a link here to a separate video in which I go ahead and answer it. That concludes this video lecture. I hope it's been fun for you. She'll be coming round the mountain when she come. <laughs> Until next time, remember, four white horses!